Welcome to Adult Bible Study with Bill. Our lesson today is about the Apostle Paul. If you're familiar with Paul, you probably know that Paul went out on everything and whatever he was doing, regardless of who might happen to be standing in his way. I would suspect that Paul's high school guidance counselor strongly advised Paul against going into diplomacy as a career. When we first encounter Paul in the book of Acts chapter 7, we find that his main priority is locating and imprisoning every Christian he can find. However, in Acts 9, he finally sees the light, figuratively and literally, when he has his come to Jesus moment. Or maybe it's more accurate to say his Jesus comes to him moment. Regardless of who came to whom, Paul does a complete 180 and becomes probably the most passionate evangelist in the New Testament. Now that's not to say he was the most persuasive evangelist in the New Testament. Paul's message did not go down well with conventional Jewish beliefs. He sometimes had to leave town under cover of the darkness. It was often necessary for his companions to smooth ruffled Jewish feathers. Today's scripture comes from Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 34. In the beginning of chapter 17, we find that Paul once again has to leave where he was teaching, this time without his companions. He ends up in the Greek city of Athens, alone, by himself, without his companions. What could possibly go wrong? Let's find out as we listen to today's scripture in this audio recording from the Common English Bible. While Paul waited for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to find that the city was flooded with idols. He began to interact with the Jews and Gentile God worshipers in the synagogue. He also addressed whoever happened to be in the marketplace each day. Certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers engaged him in discussion, too. Some said, What an amateur! What's he trying to say? Others remarked, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. They said this because he was preaching the good news about Jesus in the resurrection. They took him into custody and brought him to the council on Mars Hill. What is this new teaching? Can we learn what you are talking about? You've told us some strange things, and we want to know what they mean. They said this, because all Athenians, as well as the foreigners who live in Athens, used to spend their time doing nothing but talking about or listening to the newest thing. Paul stood up in the middle of the council on Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. As I was walking through town and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What you worship is unknown, I now proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made with human hands, nor is God served by human hands as though he needed something, since he is the one who gives life, breath, and everything else. From one person, God created every human nation to live on the whole earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. God made the nations so they would seek Him, perhaps even reach out to Him and find Him. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. In God we live, move, and exist. As some of your own poets said, we are His offspring. Therefore, as God's offspring... We have no need to imagine that the divine being is like a gold, silver, or stone image made by human skill and thought. God overlooks ignorance of these things in times past, but now directs everyone everywhere to change their hearts and lives. This is because God has set a day when He intends to judge the world justly by a man He has appointed. God has given proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection from the dead, some began to ridicule Paul. However, others said, We'll hear from you about this again. At that, Paul left the council. Some people joined him and came to believe, including Dionysius, a member of the council on Mars Hill, 
a woman named Damaris, and several others. Now for one minute, imagine that you are Paul. As you walk around in Athens, you notice all the statues and altars throughout the city. There's a God for this. There's a God for that. And then you come across an altar inscribed to an unknown God. Do you, as Paul, think to yourself, these silly Greeks just don't get it. There's only one God, and I'm here to tell them that. They have gods for all sorts of categories. They've even set up a God for to whom it may concern, in case they miss a category. One can imagine that Paul is ready to let loose and tell those Greeks just how wrong they are. Well, surprise! As we read in today's scripture, that's not what happens at all. In fact, Reverend Reed Wilson, the author of our Bible study, tells us it's impressive that Paul did not come across as judgmental or angry towards the people in Athens. Think about when you encounter social media. We sometimes disagree with the politics, priorities, and moral decisions that are expressed by others. Do you find yourself tempted to say to them, if you had another brain, it would be lonesome? How do we get past their bluster and postings? Do we listen for signs of hurt, pain, or frustrations? Paul gave us a wonderful example of this in his speech. But oftentimes, we make snap judgments based on preliminary observations. Just look at what the people of Athens did. The first reaction of many was that Paul was an amateur, that he had nothing to offer them. It took his persistence and his wise compassion not to, su to surrender to the distress that he felt and write off the elite of Athens completely. He didn't win over the whole crowd, but he reached some, and God did the rest. Talking in the marketplace with his listeners, including philosophers, Paul sought to help them understand his message. But these brilliant thinkers could not understand him. Some apparently thought he was preaching two deities, Jesus and resurrection. That's because the Greek word for resurrection was anesthesis, a woman's name charging him with preaching foreign deities. And that was a charge that led to Socrates' death in Athens centuries earlier. These people brought him to Athens' high court on Mars Hill, probably to determine whether he should be certified to teach his philosophy in Athens or not, or maybe to determine if he was just plain certifiable. In this video clip, frequent Cokesbury contributor Amy Sigmund talks about how the Athenians reacted to Paul and his teachings. In Acts 17, Paul has just arrived in Athens. Athenian society prided itself on educated conversation and debate about belief. Those conversations took place in public spaces like the marketplace or bathhouse. There were Jews and Gentiles, Epicureans and Stoics. It really doesn't sound all that different from living in American cities today or having a debate on a college campus. Paul was distressed by what he saw of the people's various objects of worship. His reaction was to go to the marketplace and engage people in conversation. I love that this was Paul's tactic. He went to people in a common meeting place and struck up conversations with them. This resulted in Paul being taken to the main council at Mars Hill, where the thought leaders of Athens questioned him about his beliefs, about Jesus, about what ideas he's spreading in the marketplace of Athens. People's reactions to Paul's speech in response to the council's questions varied. Some ridiculed him. Some indicated that they wanted to hear about Paul's beliefs again at a later time and some joined him immediately and became believers. I think that's a pretty good illustration of what we may find as we engage in faith conversations with those whose beliefs differ from ours. One commentator said that the writer of Acts did something important here. He recognized Greek philosophy as a legitimate conversation partner in the approach to God. In other words, Paul met them right where they were. 
He said that our man-made little gods, little idols and philosophies are not sufficient in themselves, but they can be good starting places for moving toward the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this text, I hear this very plain truth. You do not need to be perfect in order to start your journey toward God. And to those of us called to spread the message of the good news of Jesus Christ, we can begin this without tearing down the beliefs of those whom we meet. God doesn't require that of us. We can see different people of different faiths as legitimate conversation partners about God. We can see them as worthy of the Holy Spirit. Our call to go out into the world is one of love and moving past imagined barriers because in the kingdom of heaven, we are all equally loved. In her video clip, Ms. Sigmund refers to Epicureans and Stoics. Epicureans valued pleasure in absence of pain. They rejected gods in the conventional sense. Stoics, on the other hand, emphasized self-control and a universal perspective. They believed in fate and gods. They held that there was a chief god who had designed and inhabited the cosmos, a cosmos that was periodically dissolved by fire and reconstituted. Reverend Wilson comments that it must be strangely comforting for us to learn that everyone did not respond positively to Paul's message. That should give us the courage to speak up even when we're afraid we may fail. God does not guarantee immediate success. He does not demand a 100% return on our efforts to spread his word. God measures results by a different set of metrics. We are called to plant seeds along the way and be faithful and engaging and respecting persons where they are in their journey with God. God does not call upon us to gain immediate results. God calls us to listen and respond to, with love to the cries of those who are seeking the God whom seems to be unknown to them. I will conclude this lesson with some thoughts on evangelism. We can find evangelism a difficult concept to wrap our heads around. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus gives us the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Okay, that leaves open the question, how? But what if we look at evangelism in its simplest terms? Evangelism is nothing more than sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. But notice that when Paul was evangelizing to the Athenians, he did not mention the name Jesus. Yet people still wanted to know more after he had finished speaking. Paul wisely started with a reference to something in their culture showing respect and interest in genuinely engaging with the Athenians. The people there had erected an altar to an unknown god. Centuries before, when sacrifices to named gods failed to stop a plague, they built an altar to an unknown god. Paul used their unknown god to make his god known to them. In other words, Paul met people where they were, just as people just as Jesus met people where they were, just as we can meet people where they are. End of comment and end of lesson. Our lesson next week is about that four-letter word that we all know, work. It turns out that the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about work. Listed behind me are the scripture readings for next week. Each one has something to say about work. I'll leave it to you to work your way through this list. Stay safe and see you next week.